Hi guys, today I'm going to talk about four books that I read recently, which more or less equals what I read in October, and which by complete coincidence all have to do with trees. They are about trees and forests, or they have trees in their title, or they have a tree or a forest somehow in the center of their narrative. The first book that I'd like to talk about is The Witch Elm by Tana French. Tana French is the author of the Dublin Murder Squad series, but this book is not in that series. It is a standalone, so to speak, although all of the Dublin Murder Squad books can be read as standalones as well. This is a murder mystery as well, and it is a psychological thriller, although it is not that thrilling or nerve-wracking, so a psychological crime novel, perhaps. In this book, the narrator, the first-person narrator, is a young man called Toby. In his late twenties, he is from a well-to-do family, he's apparently conventionally attractive and charming, has never had a major or even a minor setback in his life. People usually do exactly what he wants and treat him the way he wants. And that is why he is all the more badly shaken when one night his flat gets burgled while he is asleep. And when he wakes up and confronts the trespassers, he is beaten within an inch of his life. And that leaves him with some permanent or at least long-term physical impairments of the neurological kind. And with this whole new role of invalid and a very unsociable and paranoid one at that, whom people treat very differently from the charmer that he used to be. To take himself out of that situation, Toby moves temporarily into the old family home that is at the center of the life of his extended family, where they gather on Sundays and where he and his cousins used to spend all their summer holidays as children and teenagers. While Toby is there one day during a family gathering, Toby's young nephew finds a skeleton in the witch elm in the garden. The police is called, of course, and they very soon identify the skeleton as the remains of an old school friend of Toby's who was thought to have committed suicide in, in the summer after their graduation. But now, of course, things look very different, and for Toby this throws doubt on everything that he thought happened back then, and how he remembers people and events from back then. And he starts questioning his own recollections, because since the attack he doesn't trust his brain anymore. But incentive to rethink things and to maybe question his memory also comes from outside, because his friends and family, his cousins in particular, have always remembered events very differently from how he remembers them. And now for the first time Toby is forced to take them and these voices seriously and to question his concept of what's real and how reality looks for other people and how things went down back then and how they still go down for different people. So this is a very slow burning story and the sequence of events isn't really as important as the themes which I think are all very important things that, that cannot be articulated often enough. This is about how the way you are treated and your experiences shape your perception of reality and how you can have blind spots when it comes to the experiences of other people, which are no less real just because you haven't seen evidence of them. A central and recurring theme throughout the book is how people who walk through life right beside each other can in fact live in very different realities. And Toby, in the beginning of the book and in fact a long way into the book, not only doesn't see that but he flat out denies the possibility of that when he is when this is expressly pointed out to him by other people. I think we all know people like this. Most of us will have at least one of them in our family or among our close friends. So perhaps this would be a good book to give to them. As for my reading experience, I wish that this message could have been brought home in a somewhat more concise manner, especially since, to me personally, it wasn't really all that mind-blowing. And then towards the ending there is a, a development that is very sudden and seems somewhat over-the-top melodramatic 
And Tana French did that. I can see that she did that to arrive at an outcome that is one of her signatory unsatisfying endings, which I generally really like about her novels. But in this case, it just seems a bit over the top, especially compared to the slow burning rest of the story. I would still recommend this, especially for long, cozy winter nights. And like I said, to maybe give to a family member for Christmas. My next book was A Buddy Read Between Me and Shannon from the channel That's So Co. I had had the book for more than a year and had very high hopes and expectations for it. I had heard nothing but great things about it and it won the Pulitzer Prize for fiction. I'm talking about The Overstory by Richard Powers. What the hell was that? How did this win anything other than laughter and derision? You cannot seriously tell me that this book wouldn't have been ridiculed into the ground if it had been published at all, even if it hadn't been written by some big name author. Seriously, I couldn't believe how toenail curlingly bad this was. Overwrought, underdeveloped, pointless, basic and unsubtle, and yet somehow inexplicably smug and conceited. I was unimpressed to begin with, but it turned into disgust very soon. Fortunately, Shannon didn't exactly love it either, although I snapped earlier than she did. <laughs> so this is a story about how trees are kinda important, but haven't been treated very well by, by humans, have in fact suffered for centuries from the large-scale consequences of human meddling either directly through logging, for instance, or indirectly, for instance, um, when human beings have meddled with the environment by importing bugs from overseas. So this book has an ingenious structure. Its first part, called Roots, introduces a set of 11 characters, um, all Americans or immigrants to the USA, and their family history is told. And in each of the cases, a connection is established or a failed connection is established to trees. We have the common tree hugger, the biologist and researcher, the woodworker, people who own trees or who used to own trees or who plan to plant trees or have fallen from trees as children or as adults. And then in the next section called Trunk, the discerning reader may suspect now where this might be going. In this section, some of their stories converge and others develop independently. This is in fact a historical novel and we are now in the 80s and some of the characters come together in the protest against the logging of redwood trees in Yosemite. Independently from them, the researcher, who is kind of a fictionalized version of the coll collective of all the researchers who were the first to discover the invisible communication between trees and, and other plants in forests, and the researcher develops a research further and also develops first plans to establish a seed bank for the preservation of, of vanishing species. And we have several other unconnected storylines that remain more or less isolated from the rest of the story. All the storylines end in disasters or at least major setbacks, most prominently the, res um, the protesters who have become arsonists and who end up killing one of their own by their eco-terrorism, you know. In the third part, the crown section, haha, -ha, your slight suspicions have been confirmed. In this section, we have jumped forward in time and the characters are looking back at their lives and um, the fruits that they reaped from their past activities and where the road has led them. And they begin to wonder if there aren't other new ways to go about the fight for trees and conserving trees. New ways to protest, to care about trees and to care about each other and to develop their video games. And then there is um, a, a small epilogue section called Seeds, but never mind. If this sounds tried, boring and pointless, that's because it is. The overall messages here are trees are important, humans are killing trees, eco-terrorism is bad, go make seed banks instead and love your husband. 
In addition to the banality and bourgeoisness of these themes, the whole thing is also an insight from a literary and intellectual perspective. Everything in this book is so basic and unimaginative and unsubtle and in your face. It starts with the characters. They aren't people, they are types. And their family histories are formulaic and generic in the extreme. The farming homesteaders, the Chinese refugees with their imperial art treasure, the Indian immigrant tech geniuses, and the guy who goes through the Stanford prison experiment and the Vietnam War and becomes a traumatized hermit. It's like Forrest Gump, only without the tongue-in-cheek element and decidedly without any self-irony whatsoever. Many of these characters also have a physical or mental condition that sets them apart from society in the cases in which their history doesn't do that in and by itself. And because they are to some extent isolated and estranged from society, they turn to trees or they are sensitive to the needs of other beings than, than human beings and to other necessities than the daily grind. We have the autistic ones, the schizophrenic, the wheelchair kid, the traumatized war veteran. This might sound great at first, giving page time to marginalized people. But combined with the fact that they are total types and don't have personalities, this becomes a circus and exploitative. The glorious puppet master Richie has his menagerie of special people dance for him in order to get awarded all the awards. It's disgusting. And then the writing. The metaphors and symbolism are all so unsubtle and transparent and in your face. I I got second-hand embarrassment from that, even though I didn't like the author. The writing is usually quite simplistic with that third-person present tense that is so on vogue these days, but it is periodically seasoned with outbursts of purple prose where processions of ants become shag carpets and that sort of thing. And throughout all of this you can just tell that the author thinks the world of himself and his great art. The bourgeois smugness permeates every sentence of the book. It is a smugness for both his artfulness and his literary prowess, but it also comes from the admittedly vast and urgent importance of the cause, of which Richard obviously fancies himself the greatest and most enlightened supporter. As Shannon pointed out in her review, he has a total savior complex. And where does he get it from? From getting all the awards, I guess. So I think this book is a pile of rubbish. Now go unsubscribe by the scores, I don't care. Now don't go saying that I'm impossible to please, because the next book that I have here is one that I thought was very, very good. It is The Light Tree by Frances Harding. This is a murder mystery slash coming of age story, a YA novel in a Victorian setting and with one fantastical element, The Light Tree, at the center of the narrative. In this book, 14-year-old Faith Sunderly's family are fleeing a scandal surrounding her naturalist father and his allegedly unscientific practices of let out the seeds. They are fleeing from Kent to the Channel Island of Bain, where they intend to sit the scandal out until things die down. But of course, they cannot escape scandal and controversy, and one morning Faith's father is found dead, fallen from the cliffs. The villagers are treating it as a suicide, but Faith, for very good reasons, is quite convinced that it was actually murder and goes about proving her father's innocence, because suicide was treated as a crime in those days. And Faith is going to do so with the help of the lie tree, which is a plant specimen that Faith's father secretly imported from China, and which she now has secretly she has secretly taken over guardianship of the lie tree from her dead father. Now this tree feeds off lies and the further a lie spreads, the bigger the tree grows and the bigger the fruits grow that the tree produces. And whoever eats one of these fruits, to them an elemental truth is revealed. So Faith's plan is 
spreading lies in order to make the, the tree grow and grow big fruits and one of these fruits she hopes will ultimately reveal to her the truth about who killed her father and why. So this is the central plot line, but the book is about so much more than that. It is an incredibly detailed and vivid and meticulously researched picture of life, especially upper class life, in Victorian times. And since the main character is a young woman, you can probably guess that it is very much about the role of women and how women are treated and looked upon by men in the Victorian society. Faith has ambitions, has always had ambitions to walk in her father's footsteps and become a naturalist, but all her ambitions have always been thwarted by other people and her own father telling her that they were improper or downright ludicrous because everybody knows that women don't have large enough brains to become scientists. They're just not cut out for intellectual work. And when Faith realizes that her own father subscribes to these ideas in spite of all the evidence that Faith produces of her intellectual abilities, Faith becomes more and more dispirited. Her father's death then becomes almost liberating and enables her to actually come into her own. It is not a steady upward progression from there though, and in order to succeed, Faith must question and rethink her own behavior along the way and she has to see beneath the surface of the people around her who are involved in her life and or in the story. I absolutely adored this book and the only complaints that I had about it or um, during my reading experience were to do with the fact that this is a book for young readers and especially in a historical novel for young readers I think you have to spell out some things expressly that you would or should say with more subtlety in a novel for adults. But in this book everything is articulated very clearly and starkly. And this has some unexpected and ironical side effects, I think. One of the messages of the books is that people are often more complex than they might at first appear. And at the end, the picture that emerges in, in this picture, suddenly everybody, especially the women, of course, are so much deeper and so much more and so much more complex and so much stronger than Faith first thought they were. And of course, everybody is suddenly on her side, or has, has always been on her side, and now uh, all the women are working together. And that is just another kind of black and white thinking, I think, because at the end of the day, Women can also be shallow and shitty and sexist and exactly how they at first appeared to be. So, But of course, this is a book for children and the children need to get the message. But these are all minor complaints. Like I said, I adored the book and I would recommend it to anybody without hesitation or reservation. It was definitely my highlight of my October reading. And the last book I have for today is one that I read in ebook format because it is a Tor.com novella. And it is a simply delightful one. It is Silver in the Wood by Emily Tesh. This is a folklore inspired tale in a, an early modern setting, Victorian at the latest. And it is set in a forest in which the remnants of the old magic still walk. The point of view character is 400 year old Tobias Finch, who appears to be some sort of tree spirit, but there is also a human component to him. He usually stays away from people and prefers the company of the dryads in his forest. But that all changes abruptly when the new landlord arrives in the village, who happens to be a scholar and collector of folk tales, and he just won't leave Tobias alone, and keeps visiting him in his cottage in the middle of the forest, and keeps traipsing through his forest, even at times when he shouldn't. Like during the equinox, when the veil between the human world and the spirit world is thin, and wicked things ride through the forest. 
So this is a folklore inspired little tale that is nothing wildly original, but it is very imaginative and full of lovely and funny little details and also full of lovable characters. The only thing that detracted a bit from the reading experience for me was that I didn't quite buy the romance between the main characters. But I didn't have any great feelings against it either, I just didn't see the chemistry, so I just had to work a bit harder on suspending my disbelief. So it's not like it cast a shadow on all the rest or anything. I'd say that if you like this sort of thing, tales set in the forest and the spirit realm, this is the perfect little read for a rainy day. So that's all I have for today. If you have read any of the books that I talked about, I would love to hear your thoughts in the comments. And I also just wanted to say that you may have noticed that my background has been different for the last two videos. I think this is going to be my filming location for the winter days, because anywhere else in my flat, especially in my big bookshelf corner, the lighting is just impossible for filming during the winter. So this is the boring shelf with the academic books and the textbooks and the handbooks, but at least it has pretty plants. I will see you again very soon from this new perch. Bye!